Um, my name's Lindsay Foltz, and I'm an equity and human rights analyst here at the city of Eugene. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with Babe on a few projects at the intersection of sustainability and human rights, and I'm really looking forward to the co our conversation this morning. Um, we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Dr. Doug Holt and Dr. Julian Adjaman this morning remotely. Um, articles written by uh, Drs. Adjaman and Holt were included in your reading list for this conference, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at them. If not, you might want to review them after our conversation today. I think they're really pertinent to some of the topics that we discussed yesterday. So the format is we'll hear short presentations from both Dr. Holt and Adjaman, followed by a period of question and answers. Um, so uh, roughly half the time will be spent in their presentations and the other half for discussion. And I'm really optimistic based on the enthusiastic participation yesterday that there will be lots of audience questions. Um, so I think the presentations will touch on some points of common interest that surfaced during yesterday's discussions. Uh, one that I found particularly interesting was um, uh, brought up by Helena, the danger of simply replicating structural inequities in, in the sharing economy. I think that is of great interest. And also uh, utilizing current economic and behavioral realities of mainstream Americans as an opportunity to further sustainable consumption. So uh, now for some introductions. Some of you already know one another, uh, but just in case. So uh, Dr. Julian Adjaman is a professor of urban environmental policy and planning. Uh, at Tufts. He holds a PhD in environmental education from the University of London and has also has degrees in conservation policy, geography, and botany. Uh, his focal research interest is at the nexus between environmental justice and sustainability. Um, Dr. Holt uh, has developed a socio-cultural model for branding and innovation, which he calls cultural branding and cultural strategy. Um, it's been applied successfully in business and also um, to societal and political problems, which is um, uh, an interesting opportunity to, to look at uh, some different strategies from, from the business world. And uh, I think both of them have novel insights and recommendations um, to scale, about scaling sustainable consumption beyond an elite subset of the population. So uh, with that, I think Dr. Adjman, you um, would like to go first and give us some sort of uh, general comments, and we'll take a brief break after his presentation for maybe like one burning question from the audience, and then go on to Dr. Holt's presentation. So with that, Dr. Adjman. Well, thanks, and thank you for um, inviting me to uh, present uh, remotely like this. Um, I, I would actually have liked to have been there, but uh, I do not take any more time out of the semester, unfortunately. So I'm being a, a good person in my, my home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But thank you for inviting me. So what I want to talk about really is, um, well, two things. One is my local research in what I call just sustainability. And I want to talk about that first, and then I want to talk about how that relates to the sharing economy, but also relates more to my research interest on calling the sharing city. So first, sustainability, and, and I would be derelict in my duty if I couldn't put out my book. So uh, here is the, uh, the book that you can read um, called Introducing Just Sustainability Policy Planning and Practice, which really... Um, is, is the uh, the current uh, state of the art in terms of my thinking on, on this area. So why just sustainability? Is, uh, isn't environmental sustainability enough? Well, frankly, no, it's not enough. Um, if we were to go out onto the street of Eugene and ask people what sustainability meant, 9 out of 10, maybe even 10 out of 10, would say it's about the environment. And of course, yes, it is, but it's about so much more than simply the environment. And I have called this an equity deficit of much current sustainability theorizing and practice. There's a, a deficit in the way we think about equity within sustainability. Um, and so I wanted really to try and insert the idea of justice and equity within the concept of sustainability. The second reason for this as well was noticing over the last 10 years as, a, as an urban planner how 
there's been a real decline in urban policy and planning circles in the concept of environmental justice within policy and planning. So at the community level, it's still a very vibrant concept, but I think policymakers and planners are increasingly seeing environmental justice as a, an advocacy um, or a sort of uh, an activist concept, and therefore are not using its connection to work. So because of the equity deficit, because of the decline in EJ, thinking in policy and planning, I really felt that the main vehicle um, at the local government level, the main vehicle for policy development in planning is sustainability. So let's reinsert justice and equity within to the sustainability dialogue. So hence the, the notion of just sustainability. I do tend to pluralize it so it's rather than being just sustainability. Um, I use the concept of just sustainabilities reflecting the fact that sustainability will not look the same in every place, that there's a set of principles, but sustainability is very relative and context specific. So these are some of the ideas that behind the concept of just sustainability, and just an off-the-cuff definition, improving people's quality of life now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of ecosystems. So, I don't want you to think that just sustainability is simply social justice through sustainability. Uh, you'll notice my definition does take seriously, and I see Bill Reese sitting there. Bill, you'll be happy to note, as you, you always do, that, that just sustainability is, um, is predicated on limits. Um, and I think that's something that really shows that this is a, a robust concept that has both environmental limits, but a sort of social justice base as well. And if any of you want to um, you know, delve more deeply into this, um, if you go to the Oxfam website, um, Oxfam have been doing some very interesting work developing what they call a social foundation to the environmental ceiling and limits concept of uh, Rockstrom and the, uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute people. So between the environmental ceiling and the social foundation is what I would call the just sustainability space. Uh, incidentally, if any of you are Twitterers, um, you can tweet any of this that sounds sensible. Uh, it's at Julian Adjuman, um, or and or hashtag just sustainability. So the second thing then is to, to look at, so how does this model of just sustainability fit in with the sharing economy? Well, the article that you read, which is now a manuscript for a book with MIT Press, um, this article really takes um, a different direction from nearly the sharing economy and asks if we can uh, move beyond this ultimately bounded concept, bounded in the sense that it is about economic transactions, can we move beyond that to the concept of the sharing city or sharing cities? My colleague Duncan McLaren and I argue that if we can think in this way, we can think about decreasing inequality, increasing um, social capital, and decreasing resource use. And let's remember that cities are venues for sharing space and place. They always have been. They're, they're places for sharing things, such as material goods, uh, and they're places for sharing services. But they're also shared entities in themselves. Uh, they are the product of shared creation and even co-production. And as cities grow, we'll need to uh, share more. We'll need to share infrastructure, resources, goods, services, experiences, and capabilities. And I think that the uh, issue of sharing capabilities is one that is particularly pertinent, um, certainly in a nation like the United States, where uh, a good proportion of the population, for instance, uh, African-American um, men, more are in prison than are in um, college. How do we release the capabilities uh, of people who currently are denied the ability to achieve their, their own capability. And if we don't get proactive on this sharing city, climate change will remind us that we need to. So I would argue that if we are to tackle climate change in cities effectively, uh, we really need to think about cities as shared spaces. And I think another sort of thought about this and moving into one aspect of, of, of cities as shared spaces is thinking about the diverse city 
the different city, cities of difference. And how do we design and manage shared public spaces to encourage encounter and mixing of different groups in our cities? And I've just been in Copenhagen, um, where there is a fabulous um, park, which is in a very diverse neighborhood, a very low income neighborhood. And the, the designers of the park, which is uh, a sort of an arts group, have really thought about who the residents of the area are and have looked at integrating artifacts from the different countries of the residents in this space so that everybody is present in the park. And that's what I would call a culturally inclusive space, a shared space which has taken very seriously the idea of difference and diversity. Because one thing I think that we in the sharing economy have uh, lacked is the imagination to move beyond the concept of the public. There are multiple publics, there are diverse publics, there are different publics. And as you know, we're only involved in one very, very small sector of the public at the moment. So let me give you an example, though, of where um, planning for um, public space management has actually had a negative effect on cultural diversity. And I want to talk to you just briefly about a park in Bristol in southwest England where the local wildlife trust persuaded the uh, city authorities that instead of having ryegrass, like in most parks, which is the hard-wearing um, grassland that the parks use for sports people sitting down on, instead of that, they persuaded the park to create a huge wildflower meadow. And the wildflower meadow was developed over two or three years. Uh, eventually, beautiful big sward of grass, uh, very biodiverse, all sorts of bugs and critters flying around. And then somebody noticed that none of the local Asian or African Caribbean population were going anywhere near the, the long grass because of a residual fear of snakes. So an ecological management regimen, which most of us would agree is good, had a negative effect on cultural diversity in the park. How do we think about that? How do we um, deal with that kind of um, uh, issue? Now, I don't have any, any particular answers. Uh, all I can think of is that if somebody from the Wildlife Trust or somebody from the Parks Department had been from a minority group, they might have suggested that this ecological management regimen would have a negative cultural effect. Again, we need to start asking the right questions rather than just looking for solutions. Because, you know, if the solution was um, a, a, a wildlife meadow, then we weren't necessarily asking the right question. Now, I just want to move on finally to talk a little bit about um, some of the leadership issues for sharing cities. And I'm going to borrow very heavily here from Janelle Orsi's work, from uh, April Rin's work, and from Rachel Botsman and Boo Rogers' work. Um, because if we are to move towards sharing cities, clearly there is a huge role for city government. So first, city government should uh, declare a public commitment, a vision to uh, the sharing city backed by the necessary strategies, institutions, and resources. It's almost like uh, going back to your sustainability plan and rethinking it through the lens of sharing. The sharing city will prioritize social justice. And let me just take a, a moment out here to um, talk about a, a, an issue that has happened recently to me. I was approached by um, a large city bike share program who said, Julian, the bike share is very successful, it's working so much better than we thought, but you know what, we've got no low income or minority people using the bike share. <laughs> so I was thinking, well, on what theory do you judge success, if, if that is um, a reality? Um, so what they wanted to know was, what did I think they should do to get more low income and minority people cycling? And I said, well, did you design the scheme around equity and social justice? Did you have any people from low income or minority communities helping you think about the scheme? And they said, well, well no, no. The point here is we cannot retrofit equity and social justice. It needs to be designed in to the sharing economy uh, and sharing cities from the get-go. The point is with these bike share schemes, they were never designed with low income and minority people in mind. 
They were designed with commuters and tourists in mind. So it's no wonder, even with um, subsidies for the, uh, the entrance fees, uh, even with um, locations in low-income neighbourhoods, these are not necessarily um, the sharing economy projects that are going to work in low-income and minority neighbourhoods. So I think one question for you for the rest of the conference is, what would the sharing economy programme look like that was designed around equity, specifically around equity and justice? A sharing city will need to systematically map its assets and look at those that could be shared, uh, opportunities for community engagement, you should review all your policies of operations uh, and identify where collaborative economy platforms could be used. And I think back to um, the 1980s when I worked in an environmental health department in a large London borough. On every committee report, we had equity considerations. So you had to think of the equity implications of whatever, you, whatever policy it was. Uh, it might have been brown-tailed moth eradication in South London parks. Well, the environmental health officers had to think, what are the equity considerations here? So a very simple thing that you could start doing as a city is just putting equity considerations into your committee reports. A sharing city will invest in public services. It will look towards co-production in city-led services. How can communities be involved in city-led services? I mean, a very simple example here in Cambridge is that in order to get a street tree outside your house, you have to pledge to water that tree every summer. It's kind of overproductive in some way. Cities, a sharing city, we need to develop appropriate indicators. Um, we have walkability indices. What about a shareability index? I don't know what it would look like, but you guys might want to think about a neighborhood shareability index. What might that look like? Um, a sharing city will engage in far greater public governance, for example, through participatory budgeting. Uh, a sharing city will enable um, collaborative economy operations within the city. Looking at reforming and reviewing its own regulations and policy, um, taxation, planning, zoning, insurance, licensing, what are the areas that, um, that sharing across these areas could, could work? And finally, um, the sharing city would act as a, a meta-intermediary, a sharing hub, to um, inform and engage the public in opportunities to, uh, to join not just the sharing economy, but the city as a, as a shared space. And I think I'll, I'll move it there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adjaman. Is there any, is there one, is there one burning question from the audience that you just can't wait until the end to ask before we launch into Dr. Holt's presentation? I'm sure there's at least one. This is a early morning, I know, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Julian. This is... Hi, Helena. Hi. Um, I'd like to push you one further step in your presentation is to try to make a connection between, uh, between just sharing city and sustainable consumption, which is what this meeting is about. In other words, I, I start from an assumption that a city as an entity uh, consumes less per capita, the people consume less than in sprawling suburbs, suburbs for example. But but I, didn't, I don't usually think about justice when I make that assumption. Could you help me make that bridge? Between share and sort of, so sustainable consumption and the sharing city? Yes. Well, you, you know, I mean, cities are a far more efficient and sustainable way of organizing living than spreading people out over thousands of, uh, of, of, of hectares or, or kilometers. I mean, um, you know, and, and so I, I almost see this, the city as a sharing of resources, infrastructure, food, services, as I mentioned, and that is, you know, um, infinitely more sustainable than the alternative. I, I, I don't see, where, where else do you want me to go on that, Alina? 
I would like you to connect the dots between this and environmental justice and, um, right. Well, maybe I, yeah, maybe I, mean, I am not, <laughs> when, I think, when I think of smaller footprint, I don't generally think, perhaps I should, about environmental justice when I'm thinking that. But you put this on the table and I would like you to just make the connections. You know, I, I mean, I see um, the opportunity in, in, the, in, in sharing cities, in the sharing city, um, for an absolute decrease in inequality because of, you know, the potential for more effective services. And we know that low-income people, minorities, rely much more heavily on, on public services, and they can be scaled and um, honed and made more efficient um, at the city level. That's uh, you know that's my, my take on it. Um, I mean, yeah. Again, I, I don't think there's any more that I, I would want to add just at the moment. Okay. Uh, let's give Doctor yeah. Let's give Doctor Holt a chance to talk.